This is the last video of a three-part presentation on paleoclimatology. As before, the presenter is Tom Gallagher, who joins us via Zoom. During the first two video lectures, we have discussed the historical climate record extensively and explored the many factors which affect the Earth's climate. This presentation will introduce some new factors and concepts and will attempt to distinguish between dominant variables that control climate. In studying climate, two basic concepts need to be considered, complexity and chaos. They both apply in the fields of climate analysis and prediction, but there is a difference between the two of them. This is not to place, uh, this is not a place, sorry, for artificial models based on theory without extensive study of long time series data from Earth science history in order to distinguish between the dependent and the independent variables. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, usually referred to as the IPCC, was created by the UN and specifically tasked with assessing published scientific information relevant to human-induced climate change. In their report, the IPCC stated, in climate research and modeling, we should recognize that we are dealing with a coupled nonlinear chaotic system. And therefore, the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. This is an exact quote. Despite their stated warnings and caveats, the IPCC then proceeded to combine their coupled nonlinear chaotic assumptions together to promote theoretical models that predict future climate states. It is these models that are being relied upon by governments as they commit vast sums of money in the attempt to predict climate change. And these expenditures and proposed attempts to modify climate are based on models that the IPCC themselves say are flawed. So what is the real story? What does earth science history tell us? As we have stated in parts one and two of this series, the long-term evidence is available and we should not disregard it in focusing only on the last 200 years as the IPCC have done. One way of analyzing climate is by classifying it as a function of time and predictability. This basic chart attempts to differentiate between long, predictable versus short, chaotic change. In the left, on the left, we have weather, which deals with time scales of hours, days, or weeks. Uh, in the middle, we have climate, which deals with decades. On the right, we have long-term climate change, which involves time spans of millennia. Here are the parameters associated with each of these time criteria. On the left side of the diagram, we have systems that can be considered as chaotic, whereas the systems on the right side are best classified as complex. The complex factors involve many actual occurring natural rhythmic variations, such as the Milankovitch cycles, solar variations, plate tectonics, the ocean energy systems. Later in this presentation, we will introduce the influence of ozone. The chaotic factors involve clouds, the ocean atmosphere composition, the biosystems. Chaotic systems are extremely sensitive to initial conditions and assumptions, such as initial trends, as warming, for example, out of the Little Ice Age. The factors in long-term climate need to be integrated and understood before looking at shorter time scales on the left side of the diagram. These long-term climate factors set the boundary conditions. Unfortunately, in climate models, it appears that this step has not been done well or at all. A complex system is not a chaotic system. It is made up of very large numbers of mutually interacting subunits. Those repeating interactions result in rich collective behavior that then feeds back into the behavior of the individual parts. 
Complex systems can survive the removal of parts by adapting to change. Examples might be a volcanic eruption or an impact by an asteroid. These can be adjusted for. Complex systems are dominant and rhythmic, repeating themselves and are embedded in long-term data. We saw that in part one. To be robust, other systems such as chaotic systems must include redundancy. Accurate long-term time series data can be used to separate the variable types. This we did in part one. Firstly, we have a number of codependent variables. They vary with the climate. Examples of these are solar irradiance, temperature, ocean thermal currents, the long-term thermal balance, which is itself controlled by the powerful water system and ozone. Secondly, we have independent variables, which we have shown do not co-vary with climate. When these independent variables are used in the modeling of natural complex systems, they can complicate already chaotic conditions. Thus, as in the IPC statement, prediction is not possible. Examples of independent nonlinear chaotic variables include CO2 saturation of infrared absorption as a function of CO2 concentration, CO2 hydration to carbonic acid and bicarbonate that do not absorb outgoing infrared energy emitted from the earth. Clouds, which will be discussed later in this presentation, and biologic systems, which adapt to and depend upon carbonic acid, water, and solar intensity. We'll go back to that later. So this is supposed to represent a Venn diagram of how CO2 off on the, the right might relate to this whole system of climate on the left. It's often referred to as a greenhouse gas, CO2, but it does not act as a pure gas in the troposphere. It only acts through the water system as bicarbonate and carbonic acid to modify the, mod the biologic systems, which then can go on to influence climate. Thus, it is clear from our part two discussion that CO2 is an independent variable. There is an inherent flow of energy from the Earth's equatorial regions toward the poles. Over the long periods of time, the total solar energy flow absorbed by the Earth must equal the total energy flow that is radiated from the Earth and retained by the storage system of the water cycle. In this diagram, the Earth's latitude is represented on the horizontal and uh, the equator is in the center and the poles are on the left and the right extremes. This drawing is based on one year's average data and the blue line indicates the solar energy flow in watts per square meter that is absorbed by the Earth as a function of latitude. While the red curve indicates the infrared energy flow that is re-radiated re as a function of latitude. Since the area under both curves must be equal, it is obvious that there is a net surplus of energy in the low latitudes and a net deficit toward the poles. This local imbalance results in a flow of energy via the atmosphere and the oceans from the equatorial regions toward the poles. The time taken between inflow and outflow of this energy is regulated by the ocean and the atmospheric systems. This energy flow is not a short-term burst of energy transfer. It takes hundreds and thousands of years to stabilize because of the ocean system. This is not a simple system of rapid radiative transfer as imagined by most models. The omission of this timing difference is a flaw in current climate models. In the last video presentation too, we discussed the troposphere. It can be represented in a diagram that is similar shape to the one that we just viewed for energy flow. Again, the horizontal axis represents the Earth's latitude with the equator being in the center. There is a cloud deck that can form just below the tropopause, the tropopause being the top of the troposphere, which is much higher over the equator than at the poles. As discussed last time, 
there is a step, uh, a step break um, at about 30 degrees of latitude. And this region is where the jet streams flow. Polar vortices form on the edges of the tropopause in this break, and they inhibit and block the atmospheric flow of energy. Here's a more detailed cross-section of one of these steps in the tropopause, showing polar air moving under subtropical air, creating temperature and pressure changes. The high velocity blocking jet stream conditions are at the interface in blue. Horizontal axis represents surface distance in kilometers and the vertical axis represents altitude in kilometers. This is the tropopause in two sections and this is the step between them. Their numbers, these other numbers represent uh, air velocities uh, in this area and shows the extreme air turbulence in jet stream. The dotted lines and associated numbers represent uh, the air temperatures. Two such jet streams exist in each hemisphere, and these exhibit the mixing and flow in the atmosphere. There is a subtropical jet at about 30 degrees latitude and a polar jet at about 60 degrees. These jets also define the edges of three circular vertical airflows, the Hadley cycle, the Ferrell cycle, and the polar cell. Note that the variation in latitude at the tropopause is about 20 kilometers near the equator and about seven near the poles. Also note that the tropopause is capped above by the ozone layer, the stratosphere, where a thermal inversion creates a thin polar versus a thick equatorial layer. <clears throat> this bounds the loss of energy to space. This will be further discussed in, in a few minutes. Please also note the ITCZ or intertropical convergence zone on this diagram. This map shows the position of the ITCZ, which we saw in the last diagram. The Northern hemisphere summer is the broad red streak. This map of the world shows how the position of the ITCZ varies between the seasons. The Northern hemisphere summer, the broad red streak, and the blue streak shows the northern winter. Not only do the movements of this affect the seasonal zones of heat and moisture, but they also vary as discussed in Paleo Top 2 during the Holocene, the last 11,000 years. The shifts in position of this horizon affect our current climate as well. Every year, there are a series of hurricanes that initiate along the ITCZ. The conflict between the upper stratospheric winds and the rising water energy winds along the ITCZ create the perfect breeding ground for these hurricanes. Here is a satellite infrared heat image of the hurricane Lane by name in 2018. There's the eye of the hurricane and the walls surrounding the eye are dark red in this infrared image, indicating large amounts of heat are being transmitted upwards through a large virtual funnel that extends up to 40 to 50,000 feet. An enormous amount of energy is being moved upward by the water system of latent heat through convection and is eventually radiated out to space, thus returning the earth toward a more balanced system. Here's a plot of 150 years of hurricane location data. And it shows the tracks of the major hurricanes in the Northern and the Southern hemispheres. There's a blank in the middle. Because of the rotation of the Earth's induced Coriolis forces, the storm tracks follow a clockwise path in the North and a counterclockwise path in the South. All of these tracks originate in the same bands of equatorial waters near the inter tropical convergence zones of the north and in a less significant way in the south. This is dramatic representation of energy exchange and energy movement by the water systems of the earth. In the last presentation, number two, we expressed how water made a huge difference in either a liquid or a gaseous form. It is a dominant factor in climate. Water is useful both in the storage of energy and the transport of energy. This image 
shows the amount of precipitable water in the atmosphere over the Atlantic Ocean in a single day in 2018, when there were two named hurricanes and one tropical storm being tracked. Each hurricane has a diameter of about 500 kilometers. There's an enormous amount of energy being transported by water from the oceans to the upper atmosphere due to these storms. Weather and ultimately climate can be driven by the water system, not all by trace gases in the atmosphere, which distribute themselves very evenly and store no significant energy. Let's have another look at the problems with assumptions about Earth energy flows used by many of the climate models. Here's a simplistic model that was produced by NASA. There is a, a large energy storage component in this model, which was lacking from the model presented in the previous video. This shows that over half of the incoming solar energy is absorbed by land and oceans, which have large heat storage capacities, especially the ocean, which represents more than 90% of this storage. Now, look at the portions of the energy flow that are based on the intervention of clouds and the water cycle. We must be aware that there are major differences in the time components and scale that is apparently idealized in this snapshot of energy. The energy flows associated with radiation are measured in seconds, whereas the flow of energy stored in the oceans has a time constant of decades, centuries, or even millennia. The interaction between long and short-term energy flows and storage is important to understanding climate, but it is still very poorly represented, not well understood, and not time corrected in climate models. Here is one highly simplified representation of clouds that divides them into two categories, high clouds and low clouds. This simple characterization states that low clouds reflect more sunlight than higher ones do, but higher clouds trap more heat than lower ones. This two-layered cloud model is highly idealized and is not usable to accurately describe the rich variety and fractal chaotic complexity of real world cloud systems. The reflectance of illuminated surfaces is uh, usually expressed as the albedo, which is a measure uh, between zero and one, often expressed as a percentage. Remember that albedo only refers to reflections of energy within the most powerful incoming solar wavelengths, about 0.3 to 3 microns. This illustration shows the range of albedo for a number of different cloud types at different altitudes. Note that each cloud type has a very wide range of albedo, making generalizations difficult and models inaccurate. There is a great deal of cloud variability. Clouds cannot simply be grouped into a single category by type, but need to be considered scientifically with real data. Unfortunately, computing limitations in current climate models do not properly include these. Here are some examples of comments from the literature for some of the feedback mechanisms that are included in a few of the climate models. We don't even know the overall sign of their contribution to the energy of the earth and the imbalance thereof. Just 1% change in albedo can cause a net radiative effect on the earth of over three watts per square meter, which is similar to the change that has been claimed for a theoretical doubling of atmospheric CO2 concentration. There's a lack of data on clouds. There is no reliable proxy that can be used to study the past contribution of clouds to the Earth's climate. And there is no long-term series um, data to work with. It is only in recent times that satellites have just started to gather data on clouds. We will now briefly look at some of the satellite data that is available. Here are two composite images of data collected from NASA scanners aboard the Terra and the Aqua satellites over a one month period at the equinox. 
The scales are measured in watts per meter squared. The upper image, zero to 210 watts per square meter, and the lower image, 100 to 320 watts per square meter. The energy discrepancies here need to be addressed. The satellite scanners are looking down at the Earth's mapping the energy that is coming up from the Earth and the oceans and the clouds. The top image shows the shortwave solar energy that is being reflected by the Earth, ocean, and its clouds. In other words, this is a measure of the albedo. You can see that there is a higher albedo over parts of Central Africa, South America, Southern China, and Indonesia indicating the frequent presence of highly reflective clouds in these regions. The bottom image shows a long wave infrared energy that is being emitted from the Earth's surface. You can also clearly see where clouds are attenuating this long wavelength, weak outgoing energy. In the last few years, a subgroup of the IPCCC has been formed to specifically study the influence of clouds on today's climate models. They have recently stated existing models accuracy of cloud prediction is 25 to 35%. This will require a major improvement in models, perhaps 100 times, which is a very challenging task. In addition, a second comment is that atmospheric scientists have been aware for many years that the complex effects of clouds on radiation and water exchange. They pose a major challenge to understanding climate change and the development of climate models. Some models show that clouds increase the greenhouse effect, whereas other models show a reduction. The two biggest obstacles to progress in climate research are the lack of understanding of clouds and ocean currents, was their third statement. Clouds are strongly connected to climate. Formation of clouds is controlled by temperature, directly related to water vapor, as discussed in part two. The adiabatic cooling rate affects cloud formation. Evaporation, humidity, water vapor, air density involve large energy cycles. And this drives cloud systems and makes them very different for their different layers, different elevations, and different parts of the globe. Ocean currents drive these changes and locations. Vertical and horizontal distribution of pressure is very important. Pressure fronts. Precipitation has a very large influence on cloud positioning and, and the duration. Clouds vary as a function of latitude and with their season. Altitude and topography definitely affect cloud formation. Vegetation and marine biota are involved in parts of the feedback me mechanism affecting clouds. We'll spend some time later in this presentation discussing the seeding of clouds and the role of aerosols and bacteria in that. As you can see, this is a very long list, a very um, difficult list to assemble in some kind of a computer program. Here's another look at how clouds affect the outgoing long wave radiation from the earth. Two composite graphics were assembled from multiple satellite images between 2001, 2017 that show the outgoing long wave radiation, OLR, from the Earth. One representing the situation where the skies were clear, containing no clouds, and one representing the situation where clouds were present. Next, the researchers subtracted the first image from the second to create this graphic, which you're seeing here, which shows residual cloud effect. All of the resultant numbers are therefore negative power densities and show that clouds have a very large, varying from 8% to about 33% effect on outgoing long wave radiation. These can induce significant errors in climate models. Near the equator, large thick high clouds cause outgoing long wave radiation minima of up to minus 80 watts per meter squared. Near the middle latitudes, outgoing long wave radiation is also reduced by clouds, especially over the oceans where large low pressure systems like the Aleutian low, the Icelandic low and the Southern Ocean low exist. This is where large storm systems form. 
It should be noted that many of these cloud affected areas overlie ocean current systems of the Japanese current, the Gulf Stream current, and the Southern Ocean current. Are ocean currents a major unrecognized control on these clouds? A coupled ocean atmosphere system is indicated. You will also note regional patterns in the changes of outgoing long wave radiation, which are suggesting a relative strengthening of La Nina conditions compared to El Nino conditions. These changes imply important regional changes in precipitation and decadal weather patterns. Upper atmospheric testing and fog bank testing have shown colonies of diverse bacteria in precipitation and in clouds. Notably, above 30,000 feet, most clouds are made of ice crystals, not water droplets. To start forming these ice crystals, they need to grow around some type of nucleating particle. When ice crystals are examined, they are found to contain fungi and bacteria, as well as dust. One of the primary bacterial nucleators is Pseudomonas sparingi, and is shown in this electron micrograph. This is one micron in size. These are very small. The bacteria have an outer surface layer coated with an antifreeze-like protein that they produce that organizes and binds water molecules to it in a clathrate crystalline structure. They move heat away from the condensing water on the outside and toward themselves on the inside um, of the ice and initiate nucleation of ice at abnormally high temperatures as a result. The examination of hailstones in Montana disclosed that they had a bacterial center. And this was the start of a whole new understanding of bacteria and precipitation. It was subsequently found that the ice at various altitudes also had a similar bacterial center from sampling by NASA and others. And ice nucleates around these centers, these bacterial centers. Cloud nucleation can occur around mineral dust particles as shown on the right, as well as bacteria shown on the left side of this chart. As you see, the temperatures are quite a bit lower on the left side toward the freezing point and much higher on the right. It shows us ranges of uh, different concentrations of dust on the left, um, and fungi and bacteria. Um, you will note that the bacteria are able to nucleate at temperatures just below freezing, where dust, soot, pollen, and fungi require much lower temperatures. Large hurricanes and vertical buildups of cumulus clouds produce the ideal transporters of these bacteria into the upper atmosphere where they live and function as cloud producers. Bacteria of this type have evolved over time, as shown in this diagram that goes back over 4 million years. The blue zones below the time scale represent glacial periods. Ice nucleating bacteria, so-called INA bacteria, have only been around for the past 1.8 billion years of that time. There are many different kinds of INA bacteria and we only show two of them here. They have morphed over time and adapted to climate change. They are part of climate because of their role in cloud formation. Previous presentations have discussed the atmospheric layers. This is gonna be a discussion about ozone. Shown on this chart uh, are all the layers and you see the red arrow is the area of a temperature change into the ozone layer. The temperature decreases adiabatically moving higher in the troposphere until the tropopause near the red arrow where it is at a boundary with the stratosphere. From this altitude upwards, the temperature starts to increase creating a thermal inversion. This is due to heating of the ozone layer caused by the conversion of normal oxygen O2 to ozone O3 by the incoming ultraviolet radiation from the sun. This inversion creates a cap which retains atmospheric heat. Ozone is another significant reason why the earth retains a reasonable temperature. 
NASA has noted a large variation in the sun's extreme UV radiation, which peaks during the years around solar maxima. Within a narrow band of UV wavelengths, the sun's output varies by an amazing factor of 10 or more. This strongly affects the chemistry and thermal structure of the upper atmosphere. The last UV maximum was in the period of 2011 to 2012, and the next maximum will be between 2024 and 25, as shown here. The sunspot cycle period is about 11 years long, and the next one for a UV peak will be somewhere around 2025. This is what the sun's surface looks like in ultraviolet at the peak and the trough of that solar cycle. There is a difference, as we said, of 10 times in the outgoing extreme UV flux over this period. What does ozone change do? NASA feels the following. Overall, the total amount of ozone in the atmosphere decreases by about 3% between 1979 and 2014. The reason for this has been uh, CFCs, fluorocarbons. All the decrease happened in the stratosphere, and most of the decrease occurred between 1979 and 1994. And ozone is a powerful greenhouse gas. Destroying it has reduced the temperature of the stratosphere of the Southern Hemisphere. So that's NASA's view of what ozone can do. Other aspects need to be investigated as well of climate variation. And we mentioned the biosphere. Biology affects the climate. Other aspects will be studied now. The biosphere exists in both the atmosphere and in the hydrosphere, the oceans. These are both changing and we have only recently begun to observe the interaction between them and climate. There is an ongoing process of adaptation, sequestration and distribution mediated by these biomes. This image from NASA is a composite of data gathered between 1997 and 2004. It shows the concentration of chlorophyll, chlorophyll related with phytoplanktonic organisms in the near surface waters. Note that the waters at both poles are richer where upwelling areas are prominent and also where a dead, there is a dead spot uh, that exists in the Southern Ocean near Easter Island. These blooms of biota are the lungs of the ocean and consume carbon dioxide yielding oxygen by photosynthesis. They form the base of the organic food chain of our oceans. Coccolithophores are phytoplankton, algae that assimilate carbon into their biomass during photosynthesis. Following death, the coccoliths send their calcium carbonate to the bottom where it sequesters in the ocean. Oceanic nitrates and other minerals like iron contribute to the growth of coccolithophores and thus the image shows in areas of high concentration near ocean upwelling uh, near the blue boxes. Seasonal blooms, blooms of this sort are driven by solar intensity and the presence of nutrients. These four images show the seasonal changes. These two images show chlorophyll concentration during the northern summer. And the southern summer is in the second image. These two images show the nutrient concentration in the forms of nitrates during the same two seasons. Notably, the blooms directly affect the ocean's albedo, which is reflecting from the ocean to space as opposed to absorbing solar radiation that's incoming. Coccolithophores have many different physical configurations, which are unique in shape, all made out of calcium carbonate, CaCO3. They create um, this from the carbon dioxide in the photosynthesis process. While they are alive, they float on the surface of the ocean, increasing its albedo, decreasing the solar energy that absorbed by the ocean. After death, they sink to the bottom, sequestering the carbon dioxide component and are consumed in the ocean food chain. Many types of coccolithophores have adapted and flourished over the past 200 million years. 
The top part of this graph shows an approximation of their population over time, while the bottom part shows a graphic of the different physical forms that they've evolved into. The various geologic periods are indicated as well. The Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, which we talked about in part one, uh, is shown. So this was a time, as you remember, of great ocean circulation in the equatorial regions. The Cretaceous and tertiary extinction is also shown where a massive asteroid hit um, that was related to the dinosaur extinction. These coccolithophores have proved to be highly resistant and adaptable over time, and they are important, very important part of the ocean biosystem, CO2 regulation system, and climate feedback system. Here's a typical bloom of these coccolithophores in the ocean above the Aleutian Islands. They have a unique uh, color signature, which they reflect. It was taken, this image, in April of 1998, and the bloom is occupying the area in the Bering Sea to the west and the north of Alaska, where positive um, effects or increasing CO2 concentrations have an important part of the ocean food chain and ocean albedo. Moving now from the ocean to the land, this is a composite uh, chart created by NASA, looking from the top on the Earth, excluding Antarctica. For the period between 1982 and 2015, it shows the percentage increase in total leaf area chlorophyll-based over this period, despite some areas of deforestation that are shown in red. It is apparent that the increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration, carbonic acid, has resulted in an overall increase in the greening of the world. The positive rate of change over 33 years here, shown here is quite remarkable. Current evidence suggests that increasing concentrations of atmospheric CO2 predicted for the future will have major implications for plant physiology and growth. Under elevated CO2 concentrations, most plant species show higher rates of photosynthesis, increasing growth and decreased water use. The most positively favored plant types use the C3 photosynthetic pathway. They show remarkable increases in this brief 33-year satellite study. C3 dominates the type of organisms that are on the Earth today. This chart shows the tree line and the snow line as a function of latitude, north and south. Note how the tree lines and the snow lines in this graphic match the shape of the tropopause shown earlier. Vegetation clusters exist at the equator at 30 to 50 degrees latitudes and 60 to 70 degrees latitudes. Warmer after warming, sorry, after the little ice age and carbonic acid CO2 increase have caused the tree lines of the world to rise on the mountains and move further north and south in latitude. Cannabis growers are taking advantage of this. They have demonstrated exceptional growth by spraying a mist of carbonic acid onto their crops. This direct application of what we learned about in video two has shown a doubling of growth rates and yields. It's the carbonic acid and bicarbonate, not pure CO2 gas, that makes the planet greener and helps cannabis to grow better. Our growing seasons, the length of the growing season over a long period of time is shown on this graph in the United States. The documented growing season in the United States conforms with the warming of North America out of the Little Ice Age. We're dealing with the period from 19, sorry, 1895 to 2020. Over that time, we had a growth of about 28 days, 10, 28 more days of growing season on average have been added to the annual growing season for crops, plants, and trees. This represents a 15% change in the normal spring, summer, fall cycle length. This trend is positive and is most pronounced in the Western portion of North America. In conclusion, some general rules can be postulated from both past and future climate change. Warmer and wetter conditions will lead to a greener world. As long as the atmospheric CO2 concentration is high enough as in the current interglacial period. 
Colder, drier, dustier conditions will lead to less desirable in a browner world. To truly understand this subject, we need to demand more data, a better understanding of history and a better integration of proper earth science between all fields of science. Too many significant factors are missing from the idealized computer simulations. We need to rethink our climate assumptions. Climate change is much more complex and poorly understood than has been presented to the public. The IPCC was created to speculate about man's effects on one small period of warming, not the complete history of climate change. The IPCC need to admit that their climate forecasts are inaccurate due to a lack of true understanding of what has caused climate change in the past. Integration of real historic causes and effects is still sadly missing. Notions and theories are constantly being challenged and changed by experimental and real world observational science from all fields of science. There's a major economic impact and a significant cost to assuming that the science is settled or that the future climate can easily be projected in a computer model. Politics, group popular thinking, and bias have no place in scientific discovery and inquiry. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. That concludes number three. This video concludes the three-part video presentation on paleoclimatology. Links to the other videos are provided in the YouTube description below.